and uh, that's true of the astronauts, it's true of the engineers in mission control, it's true of everyone that works at, at NASA, and uh, this is a, a very, very close-knit family with, that can come together at times like this in a very extraordinary way. The other thing, of course, you're reading and hearing, Dr. Ryde and Jean, too, is the debate that always occurs. It just inevitable it occurs at a moment like this, whether the United States has done well by its manned space program, whether we should go to machines and be more effective and explore parts of the, of the universe that we haven't done because of man travel. What do you think about that when you hear that debate? It's Peter, it's a, uh, a long-standing question. We get asked, why, why risk lives? Why not send robots? Uh, you know, a robot is only as intelligent uh, as, we, as we make it. And, uh, uh, you know, why do we explore? Uh, curiosity is the essence of human existence. And certainly robots will go, but men and women will follow. And there's no question about it. Sally said something about the legacy, you know. Uh, the, the, the real spirit of Apollo, the real legacy, is not why, well, not the technology and not all the science, but it's the people, it's why we did certain things. A day like today is part of the legacy of Apollo that will live uh, and people will remember for a long time. That's what it's about. People make things happen. But you know what, I, I, find, I find the country a lot more resilient today perhaps than we were, maybe as a result of 9-11. Here's a man that's becoming very familiar to the public. Uh, this is the head of the shuttle program at NASA, Bob, Bob Dittmore. And he's the one who I think, at least thinking back to some of the old days, who's been very, very open with the public so far and, you know, not hesitated to answer any question. But as, as, but as you and, and, and Dr. Ryder pointing out, uh, and as a professor at Harvard, said this morning, you know, somebody dies in a bathtub accident, it's the loss of a human being, but not the loss of something that is symbolically very important to us. And that astronauts, this is the argument you have in favor, of course, of manned travel, astronauts symbolize everything that's good and noble in ourselves and in the nation um, and in the aspirations of the nation. So can the loss of seven astronauts be equated to the loss of seven other people? His answer, Dr. Gilbert, not really. And yet, Peter, seven lives are seven lives. Seven American lives, in this case, six Americans and one Israeli, are still human beings that we've lost. They're all equally valuable. It's, it's you know, it's a fact that these men knew the risks they were taking. Um, their passion, their willingness to accept a challenge led them on to sort of represent our country on a on a unique and different way than perhaps other people have had the opportunity to. And it's a rare and it's a privilege to be able to do that, and they knew that. Nancy Gibbs writes a very eloquent piece in Time Magazine this week, pointing out in terms of all the symbolism and looking at the, uh, looking there at the shuttle in that particular crew picture being held by Kalpana Chavla, that we name our shuttles for our aspirations. Atlantis, Challenger, Discovery, Endeavor, the risks built into, as she puts it, the very idea and she points out, which I think other people knew, that Columbia was named for, among other things, the first American sloop to circumnavigate the globe. And the river takes its name from the sloop, the Columbia River, as it tried to penetrate uh, that particular part of the western United States. So there's, there's much more history, I think, in all of this. And we see it at the National Air and Space Museum. And when you go into the Space Museum today and you see adults and thousands and thousands of children you understand dr Ryde, again i ask you about this you about the kind of people who want to become astronauts they are invariably i suspect young people with big dreams they are and i think one of the interesting things that is so clear from the crew of columbia is that they come from all walks of life and all different cultures very diverse backgrounds and what they share is a dream and a passion uh, and a set of goals and the motivation to achieve those goals. So do this is something that's very deeply rooted in, uh, you know, in humanity. Do you see any, any difference in the space community? I've actually heard it observed a couple times in the last day or so that people aren't quite as keen to get into the program anymore. What do you think? Uh, I don't see that when I go around and, and talk to groups of uh, middle school kids, high school kids, college students, or, or young professionals. 
I still see an enormous enthusiasm uh, for the space program among those groups and an enormous desire to be, to be part of it. Now, I may see a, a slightly different cross-section of people than, uh, than you might see going out, but I still see that, that uh, burning desire to be part of uh, the, wonderful, uh, uh, the wonderful vision of exploration. Michael Beschloss. You, that, is, uh, that is tinged with the religious uh, belief uh, and will be uh, inspirational in quality. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a moment when uh, uh, people gather around the national hearth and they look to their president for inspiration and for meaning in life. An astronaut on board, a veteran of the space program. These are the, the only rationale for the space uh, program now is this burning American desire to explore. The world to know about the children that they lost, the wives, the fathers, the husbands, and how gifted they were and how much we owe them. Uh, and with some American flags. The people uh, in Nagadoshas, we know that's the center of the debris field, uh, the place where people who live there have found literally thousands of pieces of the shuttle. This uh, glistening white chairs where those family members uh, will be getting. It's unexciting to a lot of people. It's uninteresting. Uh, we've got spacecraft, we've got a space uh, station up there doing science. Science is, is, is sometimes above what people can understand. Uh, they still can relate. That, by the way, it. forgive me, yeah. that's Neil Armstrong. Neil and his wife, right. Carol. Right. And uh, I'm not sure that younger generation knows this, Gene. This is, of course, John Glenn mm -hmm. and some of the other older astronauts. When Neil came back, having been the first man to step on the moon, he was just such an extraordinarily heroic figure. And he very much retired from public view, went off and became a professor of engineering and didn't want to talk about it very much. Well, he did, and uh, I, I, I tend to encourage Neil. I talk to him quite a bit. We're pretty good friends to get out and share some of those exciting days and experiences they had with people, and he does, and he's an eloquent speaker when he does get out. But I can say this. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I don't think anybody uh, could, could, could have handled being the first man to walk on the surface of another planet with as much dignity as Neil Armstrong has. Dr. Ride, is there a burden to being as famous as you are? <laughs> um, I, I, I guess that there's a responsibility. Like. Uh, there's a responsibility, I think, that, that goes with it. And I'll uh, echo Gene's comment. I don't think that anyone could have handled uh, the responsibility of being the first human being on the moon better than Neil Armstrong handled it. He's an eloquent, eloquent speaker, and he, you know, he retained the credibility and, and the dignity that I think that uh, uh, humanity likes to see from, from such, a, such a role model. And so our memorial service begins for seven young men and women who were somewhat of a different breed. Had a lot of experience, some of them flying jets, but they were technically skilled bookworms at heart, somebody said. Scientists first and in all but a couple of cases, pilot second. People uh, fear uh, head and shoulders over uh, those of us in the early days. It's incredible what kind of people they were, uh, what they were able to do, and what they were able to accomplish. President and Mrs. Bush, of course, will sit in the front row with the widow of uh, Commander Rick's husband on one side and the widow of pilot Michael Anderson on the other, Rick Husband with his two children, Laura and Matthews, and William McCool, the absolute pilot on the shuttle itself with his three sons. All there, Michael Anderson has two children. David Brown, the only one not married. And we saw a lot of his mother and father in Virginia over the last couple of days. Very wonderfully gracious and open, sharing him with us.
of families led by david brown's parents.